Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to uh, proceed now with our next presentation. And this is a particularly exciting one because it deals with um, the identification of Thomas Kent, who was one of the uh, 1916 uh, rebels. And uh, we have here with us today James Carlson, who uh, comes to us from the University College Dublin. Um, could we could we shut the door there at the back, Dick? Thanks. Uh, so, Jens is um, a lecturer at the School of Biology and Environmental Science in UCD. He has a PhD in population genetics from the Swedish University of Agricultural Sciences in Sweden. And his primary research interest is aquatic organisms, including fishes, shellfish, and hydrothermal vent and methane seep fauna. That's correct. So one could ask, of what, what was he thinking when he got involved with the identification of Thomas Kent? But it's, it's quite a simple explanation. Um, he was approached by John Byrne, who was leading an Irish charity organisation about striped hyena biology in Kenya. And I think at that stage, I'm just going to leave it to Jens to explain how he got involved in this fascinating project. Please give a warm welcome to Jens Carlson. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, it's a complicated history. And, uh, well, the idea of Thomas Kent actually came out of Africa. It was quite interesting. Uh, John called me, John Byrne called me a couple of days getting back from Africa and told me he had a historic person who was interested to identify. And uh, Forensics Ireland were not really uh, happy to do them themselves. They're not using the same technologies. And they saw problems with their identification. So uh, that's what I'm going to talk about today, how we did it. And uh, I wasn't alone, obviously. So there's a large uh, group over from UCD, and we should have all the names listed down here. And they're coming from uh, Area 52, which is my own lab over there. Uh, the Ron Pinhasi lab, they're doing uh, archaeology and using genetic tools. We're doing population genetics and using a lot of statistics. And also John Finarelli Lab, who's an expert on statistics. We brought a lot of different people together for this uh, work. I was also supported on uh, by different state organizations, etc. and so on. Now, at the time, which would become obvious, we had uh, the archaeologists working together with the population geneticists and statisticians. I think at the time, UCD was the only place in the world that could solve this riddle. It is quite, um, uh, it's quite incredible. But nevertheless, so these are the people, a uh, bunch of different peoples here involved. Thomas Kent, of course, and the identification of Thomas Kent. That works. So, 1916, you know this story better than I do. I'm Swedish, I'm not Irish. So it won't dwell on that. But, during the rebellion, it was not only happening in Dublin, it was also happening in Cork. And Thomas Kent was supposed to be arrested in his family home, which we have up here near Castle Lyons. He and his brothers were fighting the police, the Royal Irish Constabulary, as they came to arrest him. And according to legend, their mother helped them loading the guns. So there was a, there were shots fired, and the constable was shot dead. And this is the actual constable that was shot dead, William Rowe. And this is the photograph you will find on Wikipedia, etc., or on the internet. This one you won't find in the press. It turns out that our sister school, SBBS, we are known as SBES over at UCD. The SBBS, one of the professors there, her husband is the grandchild of, Tom, of William Rowe. So it was a close connection to the actual research being done there and the researchers over there. So that's William Rowe and his wife. Thomas Kent was arrested, and this photograph is allegedly from Castle Lyons as they're bringing him to uh, the cells and so on. The problem with it, it's probably staged. The shadows, they say this was in the morning, and if it was in the morning, the shadows are in the wrong direction. So then they're walking away. Also, finding a photo opportunity where you can see all the faces of the guards. It's very, very unlikely. So we and the archaeologists believe this is a stage photograph of Thomas Kent. Well, it was brought to, Castle, to Collins Barracks in Cork, where it was also executed later on. So that was basically it. 
He was put in an unmarked shallow grave in 1916. And the British military records are often extremely good. It will tell you who was doing what, how many bullets were fired, what caliber were fired, where the person was sitting or standing. And all of that detail are, is usually in the records. This was not the case for Thomas Kent. It was unusual in terms of having so very little information about it. So, another six years passed and we still have the uh, British rules. And in 1922, we get Irish rule. And what they've done then is to have a memorial plaque in the graves around the marks of the reputed location of the burial place of Thomas Kent within the grounds of Cork Prison. So they put up this plaque, but this plaque had been moved around. So they weren't sure about the location where Thomas Kent was actually buried. He wasn't forgotten, though, in Cork especially. Kent Station, the railway station in Cork, is named after him, and there's also a bust here of Thomas Kent. So during Irish rule, he was remembered in Cork, but his exact location was unknown. And what happened in 19 or in 2015 is that they were going to do some uh, work on Cork prison. It's actually not going to be used anymore. So they sent the archaeologists there and trying to locate the grave of Thomas Kent. So this is how it looked in, in 2015, before the archaeologists started digging. And this is how it looked after they were done. And there are no remains in there, obviously. But the grave had been uh, opened, probably. And you can see a kind of a brown mark here in the grave, which means that someone has been digging through the grave before. So they found the remains of a person there. And this is what come, came out in the news. So human remains believed to belong to Thomas Kent have been recovered in the grounds of Cork Prison and the remains were found during an archaeological dig yesterday. And now the remains will be DNA tested to clarify if there are those of the Castle Lyons man who was executed in 1916. That's a very tall order. Does anyone know in here how to do the DNA test to identify a 99-year-old corpse been lying in a shallow grave in Cork, which is not the driest place in the world? And the water, water is a big enemy, big, big enemy for DNA. It will uh, deteriorate the DNA. So, before we begin how we did it, let's talk about how Forensics Ireland would do it. And that is how all the forensic forces in the world would do it. And forensics Ireland is the state organization working with the police to do all the DNA testing. The DNA testing itself is not done by the police force, it's done by Forensics Ireland. So they use something called microsatellites. I've heard today them being called STRs. Those are the same thing. It's just that in the field of forensics and genealogy, you call them short tandem repeats, STRs. We call them microsatellites in the world of biology. It's the same marker. So what we're looking at here is uh, one person here, for instance. This could be a sequence from one person. And those are the four letters from the talk we had earlier. We got a brilliant introduction to DNA. It's A, T, C, and G. That's it. And that's exactly what we see in here. In some areas you've got repetitive uh, motifs. In this case it's TTA, 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 and so on. That motif is repeated. That's a microsatellite. So we have one individual up here, or one sequence, and it contains a microsatellite. And it's the number of repeats that we count. That tells us what we call the genotype. That gives us the, uh, the name, the information about the locus. And the locus is just a specific part of the DNA that you're interrogating. So we're looking at the microsatellites here, probably not even human, by the way. Uh, all animals, all organisms have them. So they're just variants in length. You can see here, this is a long repeat. This is not as long repeat, and this is short, and look, these are longer again. Obviously, we can tell that that's more from two, more DNA than from two people. Because so two, uh, or sorry, one person. Because one person can only have two variants, one from the mom and one from the dad. And we heard that repeatedly in the previous talk. It was great. So the police force, they use microsatellites or STRs. And when we look at them, we can see them like this. This is how they look on an automated sequencer. And we look where these peaks are. So we get a pattern, a profile. And that's what they usually call them, a DNA profile. So they're about 100 to 450 base pairs long. And these are the base pairs. So you can count this one here. It's going from zero all the way up to 120. So that's 120 letters. That's the length in base pairs. The 
The forensic forces uses 15 to 17 different microsatellites. No arresting ours. That is enough to tell all humans on this planet apart. All of you have a unique profile, except identical twins. Everybody else has a unique profile. So that's why they're using it. The forensic forces have asked the genealogy, invested millions and millions and millions into this type of marker. And that's what we've been using in the police forces. And just now I'm hearing that you're moving into a single nucleotide polymorphism, which I think is a good thing. So, that's how forensics Ireland work. And what they do, they go out to a crime scene, for instance, and they find blood splatter, a knife or something like that. So they have a trace. They take that trace and generate a profile. And if they have a suspect, in this case we have a suspect over here, they generate another profile. And if they match, well, there's your culprit. So this is how genetic identification is done by Forensics Ireland all the time. If there's a body though, a human remains found, for instance on the beach you find that a sailor has been a uh, beach and you, you basically have very little tissue left where you can get DNA. They usually take the femur and I'd like to point out none of the skeletal remains you will see in this demonstration or in this talk here will be of Thomas Kent. So these are just uh, stolen pictures from the internet basically. So they trail into the femur and the femur is the thickest bone in your body. And that's why it's traditionally thought to be a good DNA source. So you drill into that, you get DNA out, you generate the profile, and you compare it to an archive. And then you can identify a person, for in this case, a, a, a sailor. In Thomas Kent's case, or Mr. X, as he became known in the lab, we had the traits, we had the skeletal remains, and they were laid out in, in Cork Morgue. And we were supposed to generate a profile. But even if we generated a profile, how did we know this was Thomas Kent? We had no Thomas Kent alive. And we had no clothing or anything like that that we knew that he would be wearing, like a toothbrush or things like that, that are good sources for DNA. So we had nothing to compare to. And we had a trace. Well, and if we could generate DNA, from that, we had no archive. They didn't have DNA testing in 1916. So there was no archive whatsoever of Thomas Kant's DNA. At least not in a, in a, a, a form that they put away. <coughs> the police force also tried to get DNA from the femur, but failed. The bone was in too bad shape, or rather the DNA in the bone was in too bad shape. And that's probably coming from 99 years in the shallow grave. So at this time, I'm going to talk a little bit about DNA integration. So Thomas Kent's body has been in the shallow grave for 99 years. That fragments DNA. And I'm just going to do a comparison. Imagine we had to form chromosomes. The chromosome actually have DNA. Uh, that's a string of DNA that go around the chromosome. It's compacted into a chromosome. If you take all the DNA and make it a long stretch, you will have, as we heard earlier, we have 22 pairs plus 2. But 23, or rather, we have 23 copies chromosomes, one of them being the X or the Y chromosome. So, if you pull it out, you can think about it as a spaghetti. And every year, a dry spaghetti, and every year you whack it with a hammer, and you can see the spaghetti pieces being smaller and smaller and smaller the whole time. And if you do that 99 times, you can think yourself about the dry spaghetti, you don't have much left. It's basically powder. So when we work with contemporary DNA, what we do is do our best to make sure it's not degraded. So we're using gloves, we're using DNA preservatives, uh, ethanol and all kinds of things to make sure that the DNA is of high quality. We have freezers, with, that's a minus 80 freezer for instance, where you can keep the DNA and make sure it's very, very good condition. This is from actual Thomas Case work. We work with uh, mouth protection and so on to avoid any contamination because of contemporary DNA it's of so much higher quality than the old DNA. These guys doing the lab work here has actually been working on 8,000 year old remains from Poland. And there's a little, little bit of a nice story from there which came out of the Thomas Kent analysis. But we're doing our best to work with fresh DNA, to have high quality DNA. What happened here 
And that's what the police force realized, or our friends in Ireland realized, is that these pieces of spaghetti were too short, they were less than 100 to 450 letters. The pieces were too small to be used for microsatellites or SDR analyses. So they couldn't work with that at all. So the microsatellites were not an option. So this is when they contact us. And what happens and what makes it so unique is that the Ron Pinhasi lab has developed a way of getting DNA from a specific bone in the human body that they can get from very, very, very old remains. And I was at the Next Generation conference, and it was about sequencing, it had nothing to do with Thomas Kahn at all, a month before the police contacted me. So I knew about Ron Pinhasi's lab and that, that they were really good at getting old DNA. And I was doing population genetics, and we got the, the conditions in Ireland were absolutely right. It was almost a fluke. It was so right that we could do this. We had the people who could get the DNA, we had the statisticians, and we had the population geneticists all talking to each other at the same time. So I brought in Ron Pinassi's lab, and I brought in John Finarelli's lab, and we started working on this bone here, which is called the Petros bone. So he went down to Cork, to the Cork morgue, and got the Petros bone. Why the Petros bone? This is the densest bone in your body. What that means is that it has, it's really, really heavy, so the DNA in there lies protected from the environment. And you have to drill this bone in a special way to get the DNA out. So basically, you drill the hole and you take away the first part of the hole, basically. Don't use that powder at all because it's contaminated from the outside. And then you use the inner parts of it. But if your drill is working at too high speed, you increase the temperature too much, and what happens is you burn the DNA and you won't get any DNA. So it's a very, very fine-tuned operation to do. This method has not even been published yet. This is one of the methods that we had to work with for Thomas Kahn. So it's, not, it's only a few people in the world that know how to do this. So what happens was that uh, the Rompin lab got the DNA out of the Petros bone, um, they gave it to us, and it was very fragmented. We decided to go for something called the MySeq ROM. It's next generation sequencing, but the beauty of it is this. It's only 65 base pairs, no need for 450 base pairs or so. So only 65 base pairs is what we needed. That's 65 letters, not 450, as the forensics people would need. We also realized that Thomas Kent actually had a brother that had offspring. So there will be nieces around, and two nieces were actually driving this whole Thomas Kent identification. We managed to get blood samples from the two nieces, so we thought, no, we have a template, but it's not supposed to be 100% matched, because these are not, full, they're not uh, uh, identical twins, obviously, to Thomas Kent. They're nieces. And then we can do a calculation, and if you do that, we use something called uh, Queller and Goodnight's RXY, and I'll tell you later about that. But what it tells you is they should have 25% degrees, or 25% relatedness to Mr. X, if Mr. X is Thomas Kent. We chose to use the, uh, the single nucleotide polymorphism. We heard about them in the previous talk. It was great. So they are single nucleotides that differ. And how they look, again, we have the sequence here from one individual or two individuals. Uh, one individual here, each row is actually one sequence. And as you go down, you can find a region that they differ. So most of them have a T in here, but in some individuals or some sequences, you get an A. So that's a TA single nucleotide polymorphic site. So that's a SNP. So those are the ones we're trying to interrogate with our 65 base pair shotgun sequencing. And on the DNA strand, this is basically what happens. They differ by one base pair. So this is what we did. I'm not going to go into detail on this. This is just a library preparation, so you can do your next generation sequencing. But what I would say is next generation sequencing has revolutionized the world of genetics completely. When I did my first next generation sequencing run, probably back in 2012, we used an old system called 454. But when I got my data back, I had generated more genetic data than my university had previously done throughout its history from one run. The second run I did a couple of years later, I generated more data than the university had done previously. You think the computers are developing fast, 
in her, but Moore's law and the number of CPUs you can fit to the number of uh, transistors, I think it is, on the chip, and how they increase. Genetics are outpacing computer development by an order of magnitude. So it's getting faster, better, cheaper, and more all the time. Won't go into details about this, of course. <coughs> Sorry. So what we did was we sequenced the shotgun sequencing. It's called shotgun, which means we're not targeting specific regions. When you run a SNP chip that we've heard about before, and there's 23andMe and so on, they use SNP chips. They're looking for certain parts of the genome. We're looking for everything because we have so little DNA to go for, so we're basically trying all, all the sequences we can. So the expected results, and you see the share number of, of data here, is we expect that 8 million sequences from each of these three individuals, Mr. X, Ms. 1, and Ms. 2. So we generated in total 24 million sequences. And if you did that with Sanger sequencing, which is the method previous to next generation sequencing, it's about six euros a sequence. So six times 24 million is what it would have cost them using the old methods. So what we wanted was this. We have all our small sequences here, 65 base pairs. And up here we should have the human genome, which is available. <coughs> Sorry. So that's available in public repositories. And then we would line our sequences up. We basically map them towards the human genome and we will find positions where they differ from the human genome on average. So we could identify single nucleotide, single nucleotide polymorphic sites. So this is what we wanted. So we, then we should download the SNP-specific allele frequencies. So these are the frequencies of how often do we have an A or a T at a certain position from the 1000 Genomes project, which is also available for the public. So the idea was, if Mr. X is Thomas Kent, then Thomas Kent's nieces should have a relatedness of 0 0.25 to Mr. X. As a control, the two nieces, they were sisters according to all paperwork and according to themselves and so on, they should have a relatedness of 0 0.5. This is using the color and goodnight symmetric RXY. The importance of the symmetric is because we share probably, what, 99% of our DNA across all humanity, if not even more. <coughs> so, it's not simply a little sharing. If we have a population that's slightly inbred, which would be every population in, in, in the world, this still resets the zero relatedness to zero. So, no matter how inbred the population is that you're looking at, both siblings always have a relatedness of 0 0.5, even though in reality, if you do a lean sharing, they probably have 0 0.98 or something. So that's, a, that's why we used the Queller and Gunnar symmetric RXY. And this is what we got. We did not get a lot of sequences so we can pull them up like this. And this is what we got. <coughs> so Mr. X didn't generate 8 million sequences, only 7 million sequences. And of those, only 26% were human. The rest of it was bacterial and other things you find in the soil. Thomas Cantonese, one and two, generated high percent of human DNA, human sequences, 80, about 80%. And they were new samples. So this is the difference between working with all degenerated uh, DNA and contemporary DNA. And why don't they get 100%? Well, your blood has other organisms in it. Actually, more microbial cells in you than there are human cells. So there are a lot of microbes in there as well. So this is what we got. Only rarely have we more than one sequence for one spot of the human genome. And that's when we start scratching our heads, like, what do we do? All these estimators demand that we have both the father's and the mother's DNA in you. And we have the mother's or the fathers, and we didn't know which. So that was our problem. So shotgun sequencing generated very low read depth, and with read depth we talk about how often we read the same area of the genome. Very, very low, mostly just once. And it was slightly expected due to the degenerated or degraded DNA that we expected in remains that have been left out for 99 years. 
So we only got one reed per snip locust, and virtually no heterozygotes. And the heterozygotes we heard about before in the previous talk was great, you gave all that information. <laughs> So you can get A, A, that means that you're a homozygote. You've got an A from your mother and an A from your father. You get an A and a C. You've got one, the A from your mother or your father, and a C from your mother or your father. But you have two versions. Heterozygote, not one. The other one is called homozygote. If you have CC, you're a homozygote. If you have an AC, you're a heterozygote. So we virtually have no heterozygotes. So we're thinking, analyze this homozygotes, only half the genome. If you just look at this as homozygous, new expected relatedness, because you're looking at only half the genome, would be 0 0.25 between full siblings and offspring. Uncles, half siblings, grandchildren, and so on, should have a relatedness of 0 0.125 instead of 0 0.25, because we're only looking at half the genome. So we started working with this, and what we developed uh, statistical and mathematical scripts to what we call forced homozygosity. So even if they were heterozygotes, we randomly picked one of the variants, the A or the C, throughout the genome on these individuals. So we forced them to be heterozygotes or homozygotes, and then we analyzed them. And what we got from that was the relatedness between these one and these two of 0 0.279, and the expected value for full siblings, which they supposedly were, and I believe they are, it's 0 0.25. So this is a number that was very close to what we expected. But lo and behold, we just said, that doesn't mean much because we just were able to say that, yes, there are siblings, and we knew that. So bring it down to Thomas Kent, or Mr. X. Mr. X and these one had a relatedness of 0 0.134, which is very close to the 0 0.125. Mr. X and these two, 0.124. So now these numbers look pretty darn great to, to me at least. But how sure are we about this? How do we know that if we don't throw anyone else into this system, that they show up at the same relatedness? So what we ended up with is simulations. And this is a big part of the project. So we simulated two different relatedness, uh, related individuals in each of these categories, and I'll show you here. So this is Thomas Cantonese 1 and 2. They shared some 3,500 SNPs. Now, those are not the same they shared with the Thomas Kent or Mr. X. There are unique SNPs in each of these situations. So they shared some 3,500. We simulated 2,000 unrelated individuals using the 1,000 Genomes data set, and we made them homozygotes. And they should have a relatedness of zero if they're unrelated, and they do have a relatedness of zero. So this is just a histogram showing you how many times did we hit the exact number zero here, and the spread of it. So the spread of this shows you the statistical power of your analysis. The height of it shows you how many individuals fell into these different relatedness classes. And these are all simulated individuals that we forced to be homozygous. This is a 0 0.125 the second order of a real relatedness is 0 0.25, but because we looked at half the genome, half that's so 0 0.125. This is the result from that. And there is the full sibling group. And the sisters fall straight into it, which was very good. That's all we expected. So we're quite sure we could identify these as siblings. So Thomas Kent and uh, niece one, they shared some 1,500 SNPs, and their relatedness was here. So these, now we are going down in SNPs, we used to have over in excess of 3,000, now we have that, the statistical power goes down. But, this is 2,000 unrelated individuals, 2,000 half-siblings, or uncles and nieces, and 2,000 full siblings or offspring simulated. And we have the estimator falling right in between. There's actually no overlap with the others. And the last sibling, niece number two. And again, we have some 1,300 SNPs, and they fall right in the middle. So we were quite convinced that this is actually, Mr. X is actually Thomas Kent, and is an uncle to these two nieces. 
We were quite convinced about that. So that's when we brought in the statistician. So how sure were we about this? Less than a million that we were wrong. The odds that we were wrong were less than one in a million. Now that's a big number. But then we also tested, what's the likelihood of Thomas, of Mr. X not being related according to either half-sibling, uncle, and above, or closer relativeness. So the result we got from that is quite good. In excess of five trillion times, more likely that Mr. X was related to the nieces than not being related. Now five trillion is a hard number to understand. We're about now, what, six or seven billion people on the planet. There will never be, and there never has been, if you combine all of humanity, five trillion people on this planet. It just won't happen. That number is too big. So, we're quite happy with the results. Uh, we concluded in our conclusions that Mr. X was indeed Thomas Kent. And that's it. <laughs>
Yes, yes. <laughs> uh, and, uh, how does that work? And what type of projects are you uh, We usually work with aquatic organisms. But genetics is a wonderful field because it's generic. So you can move from fish to birds and back to humans, and that's not the problem. The statistics, the biology is the same. DNA is DNA. And so it doesn't matter. It's very easy to move in between the fields. And I've been doing a lot of studies on relatedness analysis of, of fish. We have a question down here from Sean Quinn, so I'm going to give you the microphone, Sean. It, it, this is a very simple question. Last week, by coincidence, I posted uh, a kit off to a family tree DNA <coughs> a person whose who, great grandparent was a kid. And there's a family story that they are they are related to Thomas Kent. So, are these nieces DNA? Is it out there on Jet Match? You couldn't persuade him to do so. That, I'm not responsible for that. <coughs> I never met, his, met the nieces in person. It's been done by the police. They have been in between. We're purely scientific lab and stay away from anything else. <laughs> nice try, Sean. Nice try. <laughs> <laughs> um, I got her to take the test. <laughs> Sorry, Sean. Yeah, I will be having a conversation in a minute. Um, I'm representing Court Genealogical Society and I attended your presentation in UCC. Okay. On the, absolutely blown away with the methodology. Um, what is missing from this presentation is actually the contextual information of the likelihood of a person being buried in that location um, and the condition of the, bo the body and the, um, the, the, rec the records yeah. behind it as well, uh, the newspaper articles. So I think with Thomas Kent, you've got best of both worlds. You've got the you've got actually got the historical information. Yeah, we were not. It up. We were never really identifying Thomas Kent. We were confirming. Yeah. And but that's what we did. That's absolutely true. There, there was so much evidence saying that this would be Thomas Kent. Yeah. Uh, and the, the other thing I, I've actually come to ask you is, uh, I've been sent <laughs> by um, some of our DNA group to see if the DNA will ever be made available. And doesn't look like it's going to be. Accepted. It's not very likely at all that it will be made available. No. Yeah. We've got several people who think well. But you, you shouldn't talk to me. You should talk to John Burns over at the police. That's not my call right. at all. No. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks. Well, I suppose Thomas Kent had, um, he'll have relatives on the direct male line if you go up for, far enough on his grandfather, great-grandfather, and then coming down, we yeah. probably could have a direct male line. But did you get uh, Y DNA that would be viable for analysis from the uh, samples? Well, we got SNPs out of it. We got, there are, there are a number of SNPs from the Y chromosome, and I obviously can't tell you how many have yeah, sure. anything about it, so yeah. You can't tell us how many Y SNPs were? No. Right. So what we do is we do confirmation of where, what we do is we get the DNA results back, we look for Y DNA so we can confirm it's a male, then we take the Y DNA away because it doesn't add to your relatedness calculation because it's not on the female side at all. So we take that away literally. So we don't, I can't give you that information. No, sure. It's part of our record of course. Mm -hmm. but so it is possible to extract the Y DNA from the um, genome that you're able to recover, yeah, so that, and then maybe you could potentially analyze this is that This is why this is different than your SNP chips. Your SNP chips find markers. You, you, search, you don't search for something, you interrogate for what you have. You have a probe that finds what you're looking for. Shotgun sequencing finds everything. And there might be genes in there that we have found that have rare diseases and things like that, so that's totally confidential. That's why we can't give the data out. If it was a SNP chip, we can probably ask them to release parts of the SNP chip. But that's not the case for this type of approach with shotgun sequencing. I think the question came up, um, particularly with regard to the Earl's Barrymore, uh, could we extract and separate out the Y chromosome and then look at that genome and look for SNPs in the Y chromosome to then identify some SNPs that might also be present in present day descendants yeah. along that direct male line? I don't think that would be a problem at all. The shotgun sequencing will find your Y chromosomal DNA, so will your SNP chip, if the, it's a question of DNA quality rather than anything else. That's very, very good to hear. Um, one question then, how do, we how do we persuade forensic labs to change the way they work? Well, for them, this is not a high priority. No one is going to get brought to court for Thomas Kent. So it has very little use for them, and the investment for them would be enormous. 
they, they spent so much money, so much time. You're talking about your STR loss and you're talking about all the distributions. That's all known. That's thanks to all this investment. And if you're going to move into another field using next generation sequencing instead, you're talking about 10, 15 years down the road before they will do anything like that. Um, how much did all this cost? Can you give us a figure? Well, this was a total freebie for the Irish state. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so it's free, great. No, it was. <laughs> <laughs> so it was a lot of money. No, it's not too bad, to be perfectly honest. Now, if you have time to, because we had to develop new techniques that were unknown. No one has ever done this before. So that took an awful lot of time, a long time. So we're talking about salaries for, for the workload? Yeah, that would be very expensive. Would have been, it's not now, because we streamlined it. But the consumable costs are probably 2,500 euros or something. Well, that's very reasonable, really. So that means that all of us here will be thinking, now, what of my ancestors could I go and get? No, no. And take a comment from Patrick Kennedy. Um, I may be off subject, but uh, there's another Thomas, uh, Thomas M. Kettle. Uh, he was a Clangonian, UCD, auditor of the, uh, the, the History Society, defeated James Joyce for that job. And uh, he was killed, and he wrote the famous um, uh, sonnet to his daughter that he was there, neither for king nor king, um, king or Kaiser, but for the sacred scripture of the poor. And four days later, he was dead, and his remains have not been found. Now, the Irish government and people like that, would you, would you be able to advise them? We would indeed, we are doing that. Uh, a side story here is that John Byrne, the police representative, is now also a master's student in our lab. So we're working, working very closely with the police and, and how to develop and, uh, techniques and how to employ the latest gen genetic techniques into forensics. So we're working with them already. The problem we have is that UCD cannot go out and analyze the Thomas Kent whatsoever because we don't have the permissions. And to work with human subjects in the university world is that, that much of text and forms you have to fill in. But if the state demands that you do it, it's much easier. Did you hear the excellent um, lecture that our good friend here? I did World War One yesterday. Yeah, I don't think you were here. No, I wasn't. No. no. It, it is something that you should examine. It was superb. It'll be up on YouTube. You know. I'll grant it. At some stage. At some stage. Great. Well, one final question then for you, Jens. I mean, obviously, we are a community of genealogists and a community of genetic genealogists as well. How do you think what we do is going to impact on what you do over the course of the next 10 years? Well, pedigrees are very important, but not, from, uh, not only from a human perspective. What we're looking at is, uh, is uh, farmed animals, where pedigrees are extremely important. We do work a little bit with the cattle pedigrees. We have a PhD student from uh, Weatherbeach. And we've got access to all these snip chips and stuff like that, fantastic stuff to play around with. But also salmon farming, for instance, where you have anything that has been selected. The whole idea of bringing animals into an enclosure and then breed on them to have different traits leads to inbreeding. Even Darwin realized that. So the question is, can we go in with genetics, get good pedigrees, and then separate them out so we avoid inbreeding as much as possible? Zoos, for instance. So using pedigrees is something that's very, very important into any uh, care of animals, be it for zoos, bees for uh, production and so on. And many animals in the zoo, for instance, you don't know who's doing what with who. So you have to do it in the dark. So it's only afterwards <laughs> that you can find out using genetics who did it with whom, yeah. Well, listen, uh, thank you so much for a fantastic presentation. Uh, I think we've learned a huge amount from today. I think you've uh, created uh, a, a lot of ideas in people's minds, and we're all targeting certain ancestors in our family trees, wondering, are they buried below the ground or above the ground, and how many forms will I have to fill in? And uh, I think the, uh, the comments you've made about the methodology are also very interesting, and that's something we will take away and work on as a genetic genealogy community. So just thank you very, very much for a wonderful presentation. Thank you.